Hello, I am Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top stories. Zimbabwe's government warns opposition supporters against any attempt to overthrow the president as they take to the streets in angry protests. Those who give threats that they will harm people, they would want to change governments through demonstration, through anarchy, we will be there waiting for them. Notorious Kenyan drug lord Baktash Akash is sentenced to 25 years in jail in the U.S. for running a global drugs trafficking operation. Stranded at sea for two weeks, a row intensifies in Italy over the fate of hundreds of migrants trying to reach Europe. Also on the program, living the high life at rock bottom prices. We'll be taking a look at the abandoned airplanes bought at auction and how they'll be given a second chance. And in sport, FIFA banned Nigeria football legend Samson Siasia for life. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The government in Zimbabwe has warned opposition supporters against any attempt to overthrow President Ernest Mnangagwa, saying, we will be waiting for you. Riot police earlier used tear gas and batons to disperse hundreds of anti-government protesters who defied a ban to demonstrate in the capital Harare. 91 people have been arrested. Zimbabwe is suffering severe food, electricity and water shortages, along with rampant inflation. Our reporter Shingai Nyoka is in Harare. The police had feared violence. But today it didn't come from the protesters. As opposition supporters staged a sit-in, the police set on them. Several people were injured as they tried to flee, including this woman. The protesters have been dispersed for now, and as you can see, there's a heavy police presence. Several hundred opposition and civil society members had gathered here on the streets, singing and chanting, saying that they want Emerson Mnangagwa to leave power. Earlier, several hundred people had gathered, defying a police ban, to pressure the government to act against the declining standards of living. Zimbabwe is beset with many problems, joblessness, rising prices, and shortages of water, power, and fuel. This demonstration for today, we want national dialogue, not political dialogue. So we are telling uh, Mnangagwa that, please, Come and sit down for national dialogue with Yamisa. If we demonstrate peacefully, we want change because we are tired of promises, promises, promises. We are tired. Enough is enough. Despite the standoff with police, defiant protesters returned again and again. And we were caught up in the crossfire. The opposition has described the state's response as overkill. When you are facing a confrontational regime, we must also use tactics that are going to be above them. They can't be above the people. They can't defeat the people. Smith tried it and was defeated. Mugabe tried it and was defeated. Munangagwa is trying it. He will be defeated. Authorities deny that they were involved, but there's a sense here of a deepening fear that goes beyond Friday's events. The government, less than two years in power, is battling widespread discontent that could potentially escalate. We are not going to allow any nonsense. Those who want to demonstrate, it's enshrined in the constitution that they can demonstrate. But for those who give threats that they will harm people, they would want to change governments through demonstration, through anarchy, we will be there waiting for them. For now, the protesters have left and the streets are quiet again. But given the mounting frustration, they're not likely to be gone for long. Shingai Nyoka, BBC News, Harare. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. 
The leader of a banned Muslim Shia group has returned to Nigeria without getting the medical treatment he sought in India three days ago. Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki, who'd been in custody for four years awaiting trial in Nigeria, was granted leave to travel to India accompanied by a government security official. Sheikh El Zagzaki alleged that Indian authorities refused to grant him access to his doctors as agreed. A mother and child have tested positive for the Ebola virus in the DRC's South Kivu, making it the third province to be hit. The woman, who died on Tuesday, is believed to have travelled hundreds of kilometres to the city of Beni before returning to her home. Her young boy is under medical care. Ebola has killed at least 1,900 people in the Democratic Republic of Congo over the past year. Sudan's main opposition coalition has nominated former senior UN official Abdallah Hamdok to be prime minister during the country's three-year transition. Mr. Hamdok, an economist, stepped down last year as deputy executive secretary of the UN's Economic Commission for Africa, the ruling military council and forces for the declaration of freedom and change are expected to sign a final power-sharing agreement on Saturday. And the chief executive of the Hong Kong-based airline Cathay Pacific, Rupert Hogg, has resigned in the aftermath of anti-government demonstrations that shut down the territory's international airport. In the past week, Cathay has sacked four workers for involvement in rallies following an order from mainline China to do so. Now, he ran a drug trafficking ring which stretched from Afghanistan to America. But today, Kenyan drug lord Baktash Akasha was sentenced to 25 years in prison in New York. Along with his brother and two other men, he pleaded guilty last year in a plea bargain. The men were extradited to the United States following a sting operation which led to their arrests. Let's go to the United States now and speak to our reporter, Kizzy Cox. Kizzy, 25 years, we'd expected he might get life. Right. It was expected that he would get life because he had been involved in such a vast organization and had been caught trying to smuggle in 99 kilos of heroin as well as two kilos of methamphetamine, um, putting that at a street value of about five million dollars if it goes for about 50,000 a kilo. So it was quite a lot that he was um, accused of doing. And so it, it really is interesting that the judge did not choose to give him life in prison. But with the plea, he could have gotten as little as 10 years to as much as life without parole. So today, 25 years, it, it's certainly a lot better than life. And there are three others in the dock with him, including his brother. Do we know what happens to them next? Um, well, they still have to receive their day in court and their sentencing as well. Um, Ibrahim has also pled guilty as well, went along with the plea deal, and he's not scheduled to get his sentencing until November. And as his as other two associates also have to get their sentencing at a later date. And we know that courts in America are not necessarily uh, new to sentencing uh, drug lords. But has there been any reaction from Americans to these Kenyan brothers? You know, it's, it's interesting. It's not, there hasn't been a lot of reaction here. Um, I'm certainly the U.S. government, the DA, really wanted to get this guy because he was actually exporting drugs, trying to, from Kenya to the U.S. So there was really this importance of getting him. Um, you can look at kind of El Chapo and look at that kind of situation as well. I mean, it is not the same in terms of scale, but it is, you know, important because they want to make sure that people who are, as they put it, exporting poison to the U.S. are not able to do it again. Our reporter Kizzy Cox there live. Thank you very much. Well, the Akasha bo uh, brothers remain infamous in Mombasa. To this day, their family home in the coastal city is still feeling the repercussions of their drug smuggling legacy. Francis Ontomwa reports from Mombasa. This is the city where the Akasha brothers headquartered their drugs empire, connecting the poppy fields in Afghanistan to Europe and the United States. But despite the brothers' arrest in 2014, today the Akasha name is still feared. Sheikh Khalifa is a religious leader for the local community. He tried to persuade the brothers away from a life of crime. 
sisi kama viongozi wa dini as religious leaders we have a moral duty to warn anyone who supplies this drug and destroys our youth this is a fight we started 15 years ago the Akasha family live in Mombasa's wealthiest neighborhood, the leafy suburb of Nyali. The brother's father, Ibrahim, the patriarch of the family, was shot in what is thought to be a drugs-connected murder in Amsterdam nearly 20 years ago. But not far away lies one of the city's poorest areas. Kisauni is a hotspot for crime. Just last week, eight people were seriously injured in gang-related violence. Drug addiction here has grown alongside the international drugs trafficking trade. They normally use some brokers who are our local youths to test the product to see if it's of high quality. And in the process of testing the product, it's when now they become addicted to it and also they get to see the taste of it being something that really, really pleases them. So that has really impacted the youth in a way that they become so dependent on it. The port of Mombasa behind me is one of the busiest in East Africa connecting over 80 ports worldwide. And because of its strategic location along the Indian Ocean, coupled with poor security controls, that the business of drug trafficking continues to flourish. It was here that the Akasha brothers grew their business. The US prosecution described them as two of the most prolific drug traffickers in the world. Many accused the police and judiciary of corruption, allowing the drugs trade to take hold. Actually, when you assist a trafficker, you are not meeting law and order and you are not neither enforcing the law and regulations. So we are not a part of that. Individuals may be part of it, eh? but the service is not part of it. But police are keen to show they are cracking down. This week, another high-profile drugs raid at the house of Ali Punjani, who some say is connected to the Akasha brothers. Mombasa is fighting a daily war on drug addiction and crime. While the Akasha brothers now face prison beyond these waters, the community here struggles to cope with their legacy. Francis Ontomwa, BBC News, Mombasa. They've been stranded at sea for two weeks. Now the row over the fate of hundreds of migrants trying to reach Europe has intensified. Two of Italy's ministers have refused to sign off on an order by the Interior Minister Matteo Salvini banning a rescue ship, the open arms from docking on the island of Lampedusa. Six EU countries have, however, said they are ready to welcome the migrants. Anne Chaon is a reporter for the AFP news agency and is on board a second boat, the Ocean Viking, which has also been refused permission to dock. Four people have been moved off the open arms this morning after almost two weeks at sea. Uh, they've been uh, evacuated for medical reasons. Some of them were suffering some psychological uh, trauma, which is not a surprise for people who've been rescued in, uh, after they left uh, Libya in the worst danger condition. I'm on the, another boat, another charity boat managed by an SOS Mediterranean and Médecins Sans Frontières. Our boat, the uh, Ocean Viking, is much larger than the Open Arms. Open Arms is 39 meters long with uh, more than 130 people on board. Here we are about 69 meters long, I think, and we have 356 people on board. And uh, they were all leaving uh, Libya, taking advantage of a smooth weather condition. So they've been able to leave the Libyan coast and uh, they were uh, rescued um, after uh, between 24 hours and three days at sea. They've been rescued from the main danger, from the main risk. They were on a rubber boat floating in the high seas. Uh, here they are safe, they are taken care of, but that can't be a lasting solution for them. They need, as all the people on the open arms, they need to be disembarked as soon as possible and Sharon from the Agence France Press. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me. Peter Okwache is still to come. Finding peace after prison. We meet the people living with the trauma of their time at Okden Jail in Ethiopia. I'm Peter Okwache. The top stories this hour. Zimbabwe's government has warned opposition supporters against any attempt to overthrow the president after they took to the streets in protest over the economic crisis. And a judge in the United States has sentenced Baktash Akasha, the notorious Kenyan drug lord, to 25 years in prison for running a global drug trafficking operation. 
Now, this prison behind me was synonymous with pain and torture in the Somali region of Ethiopia. Critics of the former administration would spend years behind those walls in distressing conditions. Authorities have shut down the facility now, but many are still feeling the long shadow, as the BBC's Ahmed Adan reports. For decades, the Ogaden jail symbolized punishment for those who were accused of supporting the Ogaden Liberation Front, a rebel group that fought in the region for more than 35 years. These are the blankets and the beddings used by the prisoners held here for decades. They suffered torture and other human rights abuses in the hands of the guards, according to the testimonies gathered by the human rights groups. This was the worst section. Former prisoners say they were raped and tortured in these tiny dark rooms. I was arrested for not torturing prisoners. Such was the scale of abuse here, even the guards were tortured. This former guard says they were arrested after they refused to take part in the torture. They used to submerge me in water. We were beaten with sticks. See, my leg is broken here. I was interrogated and forced to confess about what I have not done. Mariam Abdullahi spent five years in this prison before being transferred to a jail in Addis Ababa. She took us back to her former cell. I spent four months sleeping on this bare floor. A female soldier working here used to give me her blanket some of the nights. Guards used to take me to the water tank and beat me the whole night, then dump me back in this cell soaking wet. I was suffering and in pain, and they would throw me on this floor. The authorities released all prisoners after shutting down the facility last year. However, many of the detainees did not make it out alive. Their families are still grieving. Aisha Ahmed Dahir last saw her husband at the prison eight years ago. I have no words to express the sadness I feel. The first two years I was lifeless. I was struggling to take care of my children. Sometimes I forgot caring for them. It was tough. For nearly 20 years, this was one of the main prisons in the Somali region of Ethiopia, holding thousands of prisoners, including leading dissidents. But in the future, this will become a museum to show to the next generation the abuses that have happened here. The region has moved on, but some of the families are still waiting for answers. Ahmed Adan, BBC, Jigjiga. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports and, Mimi, some news concerning a former Nigerian coach. Yes, breaking in the past couple of hours, former Nigeria coach Samson Siasia has been banned for life and fined $50,000 by FIFA after being found guilty of having accepted that he would receive bribes in relation to the manipulation of matches. BBC Sport Africa's Pierce Edwards with more. Samson Siasia was coach of Nigeria between 2010 and 2011 and for a spell in 2016 as well. But it's unclear whether this lifetime ban from FIFA applies to his period as Nigeria's full senior coach or when he was in charge of some of the country's youth sides. But what is clear is that this will cause uproar in Nigeria, one of Africa's and the world's most passionate football nations. Now, Sia Sia, who won the 1994 Nations Cup as a player and who has yet to comment on his ban, is the latest to fall foul of FIFA's ongoing and extensive investigations into the activities of convicted match fixer Wilson Raj Perumal. The Singaporean has long been involved in this world, as he's made clear in a book outlining some of his activities. And in the last month alone, two other officials from Africa have also been banned because of their links to the Singaporean. And there is a new face in Moroccan football. Former Algeria, Ivory Coast and Japan coach Vahid Halil Hodic has taken over as the new boss of Morocco. The Boston, who left French side FC Nantes earlier this month, has been handed a three-year contract. He's been tasked with tasking, taking Morocco to the World Cup in 2022 and the semi-finals of the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. He replaces Hervé Renard, who left the job. 
to some transfer news. Another African star is on the move. This time it's Nigeria defender Chidozie Awaziem from Portuguese giants FC Porto. Spanish club Leganes have completed the season-long loan move from Portuguese giants FC Porto. The 22-year-old, who can also play in a defensive midfield role, will link up with compatriot Kenneth Omeruo at the La Liga side. Watford coach Javi Grazia says his club's record signing Ismail Yassar will need time to settle and recover from a busy summer before he can make his English Premier League debut. Grazia says the Senegal international, who only started training a couple of days ago, will strengthen his team with his qualities. For sure he's ready. He has uh, a lot of skills, good qualities to to help us and I think he's an, in my opinion, very good offensive player, his speed, uh, his offensive mentality um, as a winger, as a, sometimes as well as a, a striker, he can help us and I'm sure we'll be stronger uh, offensively with him. And to basketball, where the semifinals of the women's Afro basket is currently taking place in Dakar, Senegal. The defending champions, Nigeria, are currently playing Mali. Nigeria is so far ahead in that game. Later, the host, Senegal, will face Mozambique to also get a spot in the semis. The four semifinalists have secured their place at the Olympic qualifying tournament later this year. And staying with basketball, Ghanaian John Manio Plange has been named as the new vice president and head of strategy and operations for Basketball Africa League, which tips off next year. Plange is also the head of NBA Africa, head of operations. And that's all the sport, Peter. Congratulations to him. Indeed, <laughs> very good post. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. All right. Now, have you ever wanted to own your own private plane? I know I have, but for most of us, the cost involved would make that an impossible dream. But a few savvy shoppers have snapped up some abandoned aircraft at a cut price auction in Nairobi. The cheapest one costing around $1,000. Sounds great, right? But what will the new owners use them for? Check this out. I got a DH7, which was the largest one that they had, and I want to convert it into a personal residential home or probably put it on Airbnb. Would you buy an aeroplane for $1,000? 12 aeroplanes were auctioned at Nairobi Airport. They weren't all in great condition. We were auctioning aircraft that have been uh, sitting on prime space at the airport. I came to look for an aircraft for the purpose of training students. It was very competitive, though I managed to win. We decided to choose this plane by the model of Aerocom uh, because it has all intact engines and therefore we saw it is good for training purposes. What motivated me was that, of course, in order to create something that I could uh, that could be livable, had to be big. So the biggest one available was the DH7 and it was in the best condition compared to the others. Um, first we have to dismantle it and then I'm going to get a low loader and then load it up with a crane and then take it to the destination. Out of the 12 planes available for auction, seven were sold. And from buying planes to buying countries, let's leave you with this. Denmark has reacted with bemusement to reports that President Trump has been asking his aides whether the US could buy Greenland. Danish politicians have been lining up to express astonishment at the prospect of selling the autonomous territory, which is home to a U US air base. The American president is expected to visit Denmark later this month. Let's see if it puts in an offer. To own a private plane and a private island. Now, that would be life. That's it from Focus on Africa for today. From me, Peter, and Okwache, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.